All right, we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for the book of Numbers, and I ask that you speak to our hearts through it, and that you would help us to understand you more, and to walk more intimately with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Neil, could you get a little more house light a little bit, please? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we are in the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses, five books of Moses. We just rolled into the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, we have... Um, The first couple chapters looking at the numbering of the actual tribes and if you have the New King James Version as as we discovered last week It's a little hard to read through. Okay, so I moved on to the Bible in basic English during last lesson if if you uh, re Revisit that but today we're going to pick up in chapter 3 But the book of numbers and Deuteronomy will see a lot of these are concurrent with each other This is in the 10 to 14 month period after the Israelites came out of Egypt And here we have the census that is given. And we have a certain formation. That's what I wanted to send you. You have a formation of the three tribes on each end of the tabernacle. And then you also have an importance that we'll look into today of the Levites and where they were to be uh, stationed. And some of the importance of having a job, having a place. We talked about that last week. And not taking the things of God lightly. Um, So we'll pick up. In chapter 3, we just looked at the armies that were numbered, and we're looking at the Levites who were called to serve. Now these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests whom he consecrated to minister as priests, Nadab and Abihu, who had died before the Lord when they had offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children, so Eleazar and Ithamar ministered as priests in the, in the presence of Aaron their father. So remember Nadab and Abihu, why did they die? Because they offered strange fire. What was that exactly? They did what was not prescribed. God was not pleased with them. They were distracting. When the glory of the Lord came down on the actual uh, tabernacle above the most holy place, God was showing up and they were showing off. And God said, I'll have none of that. And they were dead. And so we need to take heed that God will not share his glory with another. So verse 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may serve him. And they shall attend to his needs and all the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting. To do the work of the tabernacle. Also they shall attend to the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting. And to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him for, or from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. We talked about that last week briefly. The priesthood was not something that Aaron or Moses chose to be a part of. It was what God had ordained. And so, so too, be careful not to try to force what God's called you to do. Do what God's called you to do and let him promote you. If we humble ourselves, he'll exalt us in due season. He'll lift us up. So like Jesus said, take a seat of low honor. And then the person having the banquet will say, hey, you belong up here and he'll have you move. And that's where the honor is. Let God promote us, right? Does that make sense? But here, they are not to just approach the tent. This tent was the most holy place in all the world. It represented the, the actual presence of God. God is everywhere. God is spirit. But he had a unique way of visiting his people in a profound way, in his glorious way, with fire and and with uh, power. Notice, and also, they were led by a pillar of fire by night, and they were led by a pillar of cloud during the day. That's another thing we need to not forget. We've got almost 2.5 million people that just came out of Egypt. They've seen some miraculous things happen, and now God is saying, this is exactly the way I want you to set up your tents, and this is exactly who I want to serve me. It's the Levites. Remember... In Exodus chapter 20, when he received the Ten Commandments, Moses came down, and the Levites were the only ones who stood with Moses when he said, Who is for the Lord? Who's going to stand with the Lord? All the Levites came forward, and then he burnt the golden calf that they had made, and he put it on water and made everybody drink it, basically. He punished the people for worshiping an idolatrous calf, because that's what the Egyptians worshipped. He said, God saved you. This is not the God who saved you. Aaron said it was the people's fault. He said, miraculously, it happened. No, he enabled them. 
but nonetheless, the tribe of Levi were the only people who came. And we'll see there's about 20, 22,000 of them here early on in the nation of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to the priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this is God speaking. Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel. Instead of the firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel, therefore the Levites shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. Notice, they covered their doorpost and the top with lentils and or with the blood of the lamb. So he's saying, every firstborn is covered with the blood of the lamb and they belong to me. So look at us. We are firstborn, according to faith in Jesus Christ, covered by blood, and we belong to the Lord. As Paul says, and we have a huge problem right now in our society with sexual immorality. He said, do you not know that you were bought with a price? You are not your own. So glorify God with your body. You belong to the Lord. Now that's just a New Testament illustration that you belong to the Lord. But if I realize I belong to the Lord, I won't just do whatever I want to do, right? I need to live for the Lord who bought me, who shed his blood, just like the Passover lamb that bought the children of Israel. So, on the day I struck the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified myself all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. He says, this is who I am. Don't forget who I am. I'm, this is not just your imagination. This is the God who made all things. We belong to him. I'm sure that the people of Israel thought that was awesome. I hope they did. Many of them didn't, and they died in the wilderness. We'll see throughout this book. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of Levi by their fathers' houses and by their families. You shall number every male from a month old and above. So Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord, and as he was commanded, he obeyed. I like this. Um, but my boys pointed out, it's just a month old, or it's basically a child who has survived childbirth. That's one month old, a toddler or a, or a brand new infant, basically, and older. And so he goes through all the sons of Gershon, Kohath, Merari, their names, the sons of Gershon, and he numbers them all off. And I could read through all of that, or we could just kind of go to the, the conclusion there. Um, but there were 7,500. We have uh, the families of Gershonites camp. Okay, I'll just read it because looking at this, they have four different, just like the tribes of Israel, God wanted to make sure there was nothing, nothing left um, undealt with, and they were surrounding the tabernacle. Verse 16, So Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord, as he was commanded. These were the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These are the names of the sons of Gershon by their families, Libni, Shimei, and the sons of Kohath by their families, Amram and Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The sons of Merari by their families, Malai, Mushai, these are the, the families of the Levites by their father's houses. From Gershon came the family of the Libnites and the family of the Shemites, and they were the families of Ger Gershonites. Those who were numbered according to the number of all the males of the month old and above, those who were numbered, they were 7,500. The family, so on one side of the tabernacle, the families of the Gershonites were to camp behind the tabernacle to the westward. Notice the tabernacle faced the, faced the morning sun. So at the very back of the tabernacle is where Gershonites were. And the leader of the father's, father's house of the Gershonites was Eliasaph, the son of Lael. The duties of the children of Gershon and the tabernacle of meeting included the tabernacle, the tent and its covering, the screen for the door and the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the court, the hangings of the court, and all around the tabernacle and all the altar and their cords according to the work relating to them. So the Gershonites were in charge of like the, the hangings and everything and all the, um, the doors. From Kohath came the family of the Amram, Amramites, the family of the Iz, Izharites, the family of the Hebronites, or Hebronites, and the family of the Uzielites. These were the families of the Kohathites. According to the number of the, all the males of month old, there were 8,600. So we have 7,500, 8,600, keeping charge of the sanctuary. The families of the children of Kohath were to camp on the south side of the tabernacle, and the leader of the fathers of the house of families of the Kohathites was Elizaphan, and he was the son of Uziel. Their duty included the ark. So the others had the, the screens and the, um, 
and the hangings, and now they had the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, the utensils of the sanctuary, with which they ministered the screen and all the work relating, relating to them. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, was to be chief over all the leaders of the Levites with oversight of those who kept charge of the sanctuary. From Merari came the family of the Malalites, or the Malites, and the family of the Mushites. These were the families of Merari. And those who were numbered, according to the number of all the males of six months old or above, were 6,200. So we have uh, very similar numbers on each side, about six or 7,000 on each side. The leader of the father of the house of the families of Merari was Zuriel, a son of Abai, uh, Abba, Abba Hail. These were to camp on the north side of the tabernacle, and the appointed duty of the children of Merari included the boards of the tabernacle and its bars, its pillars, its sockets, its utensils, and all the work relating to them, and the pillars of the court all around with the sockets, with their sockets and their pegs and their cords. So these were the guys who had to pick up all the pieces of wood. They had to fashion it. You remember we had kind of like a tongue and groove or a socket uh, arrangement for the actual tabernacle. It was, remember the tabernacle was the size of about an average house. All those wood, pieces of wood, would, no pun intended, they would be connected together with poles, acacia wood, and, and this, is, this is beautiful on the inside, gold on the inside, but all the badger skin and the leather and the, the different materials on the outside, the further you got out, the more tough it was, rugged it was on the outside. The further you got in, the more beautiful it was, but it had the wood, and they would have to then break it down. It was like a mobile home or a mobile uh, palace of sorts, a mobile temple that they could move. And notice there was a 75 foot by 150 foot courtyard around it, and there was a pole every 10 or 15 feet or so. And they had to carry all of those poles, they had to carry all of the wood, and it was a nice, you think packing for camping is hard? Imagine packing for this thing that's the size of a house, and your tribe, all 6,000 of you, is responsible for moving an entire house. Have you ever seen the Amish pick up an entire house? If you haven't seen a video, they have videos out there where Amish communities, they'll have 100 people, and they'll take a house, and they'll lift it up and put it on the foundation, and all 100 people are picking up the entire house all at once. It's amazing with cooperation what a couple few hundred people or a thousand, few thousand people could do in a short period of time. I'm trying to train my kids to understand this because when all four of us, all five of us were cleaning up the basement two days ago, it went lickety split. Actually, it was yesterday morning. It went super fast. So it's amazing. God had this all appointed, and that woodwork had to stay intact because if it broke, they'd have to repair it. So they may have been carpenters of sorts. So priests and carpenters, kind of like our Savior. And I just went way too far ahead. Okay. So the pegs and even all that. So verse 38. Moreover, I think that is interesting. They were practically carpenters. They were priests. They had to deal with pegs, which were like the, the nails that Jesus had that pierced through him. I mean, in some ways, in some ways, God, I'm sure if I was a Kohathite, and or from Merari and I went up to heaven and I get to see Jesus and I think that he died on a wooden cross that looks a lot like the, the post that I put up all around the tabernacle every time we had to move it I'd be thinking how glorious that everything that we worked toward our entire life pointed to what you had to do on Calvary and I, I think there's some symbolism there that there's the pegs and there's the wood and there's just thinking about that so and we move on verse 38 moreover those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tabernacle of meeting, interestingly, this is the entrance, were Moses, Aaron, and his sons keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel, but the outsider who came near was to be put to death. All who were numbered of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord by their families, all the males from a month old and above were 22,000. Okay, so once again, notice, Moses and Aaron guarded the way to the entrance, the east side of the tabernacle. We had a, a, a 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, like basically wall, like fence that's so tall you couldn't see over it. And it has like sheets and material and the tent peg or the pegs and the wood. But when they come in at the entrance, 
Moses is a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and it just shows here the priest who is Levi or Aaron of the tribe of Levi and Moses who was the prophet or the, the law and in the sense he was speaking forth the word of God prophesying to the people. They had to go through Moses to give their offering. We have to go through Jesus Christ to be accepted to God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If Moses is a type of Jesus, it's very strategic that God put Moses at the entrance. Moses isn't at the back. He's not at the north or the south. He's at the east entrance of the tabernacle. It's very significant that you must go through Moses. Because someone who comes in an unworthy fashion would be utterly destroyed. I, I don't want to get into the minutiae of that. But you weren't to come just any old person could come. You had to come in the way prescribed and you had to be accepted probably by, by faith. I'm sure there were aliens that traveled out of Egypt with Israel, but no one just walked up to the tabernacle. They had to go through Moses. So just looking at that, we don't just come up to God and say, hey God, you're my buddy. No, you come through Jesus. You come through his, his chosen, chosen one. 22,000, so we have about six or 7,000 on, on the north, the, the west and the south side. And on the east side, we have Moses and Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, Number all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month and above, month old and above, and take the number of their names, and you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel, and the livestock of the Levites, instead of the firstborn among the livestock of the children of Israel. So Moses numbered all of the firstborn among the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded him. And all the firstborn males, according to the number of the names of the month, from a month old and above, of those were numbered of them, were 22,273. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of, from, instead of all the firstborn from among the children of Israel, and the livestock of the Levites instead of their livestock. The Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. Remember, the Levites have no inheritance. And he's saying they're going to take the place of the firstborn. And their, even their animals were the Lord's. And for the redemption of the 273 firstborn of the children of Israel, who are more than the number of Levites, because remember there were 22,273, so there's 273 extra, you shall take five shekels for each, of, each one individually, and you shall take them in the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel of 20, it's, it's equal to 20 geras. It's, it weighs so much. And you shall give the money, which is... Uh, with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and his sons. So Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those who were redeemed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the children of Israel, he took the money, 1,365 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And Moses gave their redemption money to Aaron and his sons, according to the word of the Lord, and the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. So, quick synopsis. We have three sides of the tabernacle, and you have the sons of uh, the Gershonites, the um, Merarites, and, and the Kohathites. And then at the front you have Moses and Aaron, and there were 22,000 Levites, there were 22,273 Israelite firstborns, and God's saying, I want to redeem them. And they gave some extra money. Who gets that extra money? The priesthood. Should the priest have to, have to work so much that there's a hardship that that they're punishing the priests that are giving their lives up for the people? No. God, in all of his provisions, God wants people to serve him with joy and gladness. God did not want to punish the Levites more than anybody else. God is a God of equity. God is a God who's fair. And God is a God of, of love and justice. But he, he's also a God who's wise and providing. And these Levites were doing the work every day. So we want to make sure they were taken care of. And so it's, I think it's important that we honor those who, who serve the Lord. Uh, you look at Pastor Bruce's work ethic. You look at missionaries around the world. You look at people who they give their life for the Lord's sake. And they don't look for any accolades or anything. But we just should respect that, not abuse that, and find that balance to love them and appreciate them for what they do. So looking at this, God has a way, though. God has a way even when people don't appreciate his servants of taking care of his own. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 1 of chapter 4, and Aaron, saying, Take a census, census of the sons of Kohath from among the children of Levi, by their families, by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even, even to 50 years old. 
all who enter the service to do the work of the tabernacle meeting. I'm 35 years old. So you had to be 35 years old to serve as a Levite. It's interesting. I lead music, and I teach, and I serve at the church, and I'm 35. So it's just kind of interesting. Jesus was 30, 30 and 33, 30, three years of his life. There's something about, and not knocking men, but the maturity level of a man takes us a little longer, but about 21 to 35, a lot of maturity occurs there. Um, many of them had children. You know, I, I used to belong to a church where priests could not have children. And when you don't have children, then you burn because you don't have that natural need for a family and a wife satisfied. And so you see all sorts of problems with that celibacy. But here, I'm sure they were a father by then, probably, probably married. If not, they were a single person who knew that they were meant to be single. And looking at that, they knew um, these are, these are, they have work to do. If you're able-bodied and God has made you, God has made you to glorify him. If you were like, what's my purpose? To glorify God. Well, I don't know what that is. What are you good at? God wants to use that. If you're good at computers, I'm good at music, or I'm good at, you know, helping and encouraging and cleaning, and organizing and creating, photography, you know, being thoughtful, generous. Use what God's given you and then let him open more doors for you. It's pretty exciting. So from 35 to 50, this is the service of the sons of Kohath. In the tabernacle of meeting relating to the most holy things, when the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his sons shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and the cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put the covering of badger skins and spread over, which was insulating, I'm sure, and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue, and they shall insert its poles. So they wanted to really make sure that they covered the ark carefully. Anybody had something valuable that you left outside and then it got rained on? Anybody ever done that? I don't want to say it. Do I need to say it? Should I say it? No. Okay, well, it happens to me all the time, okay? I could, let me count the ways, all right? But uh, one was particularly bad, but my wife loves me anyway. So, yeah, uh, her Bible that she's holding right now was on the, what, is, what do you call it on the back of your car? The blazer, or what do they call it? The, the wing on, on, yeah, on the roof of the car. You know, the back, she has a little wing on the back of her car for aerodynamics. Yeah, I left her Bible on top of that. And it was there a day and a half later. And it had rained. And so it was stuck to her car. Anyway, so, yes, I am so great. No, but looking at that, God is gracious. I was able to blow dry it, and then I was able to iron it. But you look at that. They wanted to protect the Ark of the Covenant. They wanted to make sure that this Holy of Holies was not treated like a common thing. And I think today, we need to protect the sanctity of life, the sanctity of love, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of family, the sanctity of every human being being made in the image of God. And yet, the world, in an interesting fashion, is wanting to rip apart all of that and leave us out to the elements and say, God is not... Uh, existent and so let's just let us be destroyed no God's saying here you better cover it up and cover it up in royalty royal blue right and cover it with badger skins insulate it we are filled with the Holy Spirit we are claimed to be royalty and God protects us from within with his Holy Spirit but he also protects us from without with his angels and by his hand so the Ark of the Covenant they would cover it and the table on the table of showbread, verse seven, they shall spread a blue cloth and put on it the dishes, the pans, the bowls, and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. This is where you got tablecloth, so you could easily clean up your kitchen table. You just take the tablecloth and put it there, right? We need to teach our kids to clear the table. But in all seriousness, they kept it all together. They shall spread over them a scarlet cloth and cover the same with a covering of a badger skins, and they shall insert its poles. So you notice you have the, the royal blue and the crimson red, right? The, the royalty of Jesus Christ, the red of his blood that was shed for us. And they shall take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand of the light with its lamps, its wick trimmers, its trays, and all its oil vessels, with which they service it. Then they shall put it in all its, with all its utensils in a covering of badger skin and put it on, the carry, on a carrying beam. So notice, I have a guitar case right here. 
and I took it to Israel with me. Everywhere I went, I was carrying that guitar case. Did I leave my guitar outside of the case on purpose and leave it out for just anybody to touch it? No. But they're carrying these poles, and as you can imagine, they're carrying the poles with hundreds of pounds worth of gold and very heavy uh, articles. And anytime they had to move, they had to make sure it was covered in badger skin. So they had these fitted, like you can imagine if you've seen a seven branched uh, lampstand, what we would call the menorah, so to speak. If you could see that, they, they would probably have sleeves. Anybody play golf and you have golf club head covers, right? It's kind of like that, but they would have it all out of badger skin and you would cover it just like I put my guitar in a guitar case. You put it in there and then they put it on poles and they walked. So I hope that they didn't, and we think about it, they did camp several places and they moved dozens of times. You can imagine. Um, but every bit of thought God prepared so that, and even to this day, we still have articles or they're making articles for another temple, which is a mystery of sorts. But it was important to them that the way that God prescribed them to worship was intact, that this is something holy, covered with badger skins. And they shall take a blue cloth over the lamp stands of light. We already read that. And over the golden altar, verse 11, they shall spread a blue cloth and cover it with a covering of badger skins. They shall insert its poles. Notice, remember, we, we talked about the uh, Bezalel made the altar, he made the table, and they had poles. They had poles for the acacia wood to go through. So, very smart. Have you ever tried to move a refrigerator up or downstairs? Right? Have you ever tried to get a couch down a crook, crook of a, a two, like an L shaped staircase, right? So, they, they knew that these poles, the holes were there, and God was genius, basically. If all of our appliances just had the little holes, we could stick a pole through them. But they, they didn't have stairs or anything, but they had to carry it for long periods of time, for miles. So God made to, to wear multiple people, just like a casket, but with poles going through. Multiple people, a lot of hands, lighter load. God knew what he was doing. So we had the altar. And then shall take the utensils of the service, verse 12 with which they minister in the sanctuary and put them in the blue cloth, cover them in the covering of badger skins and put them in the carrying, on a carrying beam. Also, they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. I've uh, been barbecuing. You have to take the ashes out, right? But then they said the altar needs to be covered with badger skins. They shall put on it all its implements with which they minister there, the fire pans, the forks, shovels, basins, all the utensils of the altar, and they shall spread on it a covering of badger skins and insert its poles. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These are the things of the tabernacle of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. Anybody seen, I, I haven't seen the whole movie, I don't think, but Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, and if you, I remember growing up as a little kid, and uh, I'm not trying to age myself, but like they, anybody who looked at the Ark, the, like spirits would come out of the Ark and they'd be slain or something like that. But in all seriousness, they weren't to touch it. So I talk about covering it with the badger skins, then they would hang it from a hook and put it on a pole and they weren't to touch it. So. Once again, don't touch the glory of God. It is his alone. He will not share it with another. The appointed duty of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, is the oil for the light, the sweet incense, the daily grain offering, the anointing oil, the oversight of the tabernacle of all that is in it, with the sanctuary and its furnishings. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, do not cut off the tribe from the families, uh, the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites. Hey, don't cut off the Kohathites because they're the only ones that will uh, carry around everything. <laughs> don't get them angry, right? Do not cut them off. Let's go back to the anointing oil of Eleazar. Okay? Eleazar, if you look back to the time of Abraham, when he found the bride for his son Isaac, it said he sent his servant and never names the servant. We later come to find that Abraham's servant was named Eleazar. Right? But he sent this unnamed servant to go get Rebekah for Isaac, his bride. 
And that's a type of God the Father sending the Holy Spirit to go find a bride for his church, which is us. Whether Jews or Gentiles, all who come to Christ, he sends his Holy Spirit out into the world. Just like a wedding, wedding banquet. He invites us to come. Well, Eleazar is like a helper, right? Now, the oil, think about it. They left Egypt. They're out in the middle of the desert. Are there olive trees growing everywhere in the, in the desert? I'm just trying to rectify in my mind. They would use the purest form, like 5% of olive oil is that very pure olive oil that burns with no smoke. It's a very pure burn. But I'm like, they never stayed somewhere long enough to have a good orchard or a good olive grove. So how did they do that? I mean, think about it. How did God provide the water for them? How did he provide the, the meat for 2.5 million people? For 40 years we'll learn that they maintained this. It's a miracle of God. I don't know how they did it. And, and maybe they traveled miles and would come back and they kept their camp where it was, but they found some wild olive trees. But then they still had to use a stone and they had to get a millstone and they had to grind those oils out of the olives. And all the work, you think, oh, we just read, oh, he was in charge of the olive oil or the oil. That's cool. No big deal. All he had to do was pour some oil. What are you talking about? They're in the middle of the desert, right? So you think about, it. oh, I want to be a pastor. Oh, you do? Oh, it's going to be so much better in my current job. Really? The people will be so much better. They'll be so much nicer. They won't have any problems. Are you serious? <laughs> it's like, no, there's so much work that goes into it. So it's like looking at that. This, this guy, Eleazar, quite a man, right? Daily, and this is every day, all day, every day, right? They got the Sabbath off, Friday nights to Saturday nights. That's it. But all day, every day, he was thinking, you know, Rachel and I and Cassie, you know, we're always like thinking and doing things. But I talked with Ryan, Rachel's husband once, and he's like, yeah, it's hard to turn it off. It's hard to turn it off when you're thinking about the next thing you're doing, the next thing you're doing. But that's a sermon, right? You're like, Lord, what do you have me to do? And you as parents, who stayed up till 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock almost every night helping make, you know, midnight, just making sure that the house was in order, right? When your kids are growing up. And you think about it. God gives us the strength, and he gives us the motivation, and he gives us the power but it's, it's interesting that if you're walking with the Lord, he continues to provide it like oil for a lamp, interestingly enough. And that is a symbol of the anointing of God and his Holy Spirit. We are going to run out of time. Don't you love the Old Testament, okay? We will pick up in this three to five next time we get together. But the Kohathites, just think about it. They were... The Gershonites were the ones with, with regard to the tents and the screens. We had the, the Kohathites. We had the Merarites, right? And you think about it, all this laborious work, for what? Why did they have to work so hard? Do you realize how hard they were working in Egypt? <laughs> I don't realize it. I have no idea. Have you seen the pyramids? Have you heard of the harsh treatment that we read of just a few, few chapters ago? And I think for us, we may get to a point where we say, God, it's hard. It's hard to do everything you've called me to do, God. But God would say, look at the alternative. Look where I brought you from and what I saved you from. There's no reason. If you complain, and we'll see this in chapter 11 and 12 and 20 and 24 and... As you go through numbers, you'll see complaining after complaining after complaining. This is a good book for us to look at and say, I don't want to be like that. I want to be like Jesus, right? And so if you're here today and you say, things are kind of hard. I want to complain sometimes because I do sometimes. But may we, you know, God strengthen us, right? May he strengthen us. May he strengthen you. Let's, let's pray. If you're here this morning, you say, you know, the numbering of, of the tribes of Levi, that's interesting stuff. And Moses, yeah, everybody needs to come through Moses to get to the, to the most holy place. Well, I would say Jesus is our Moses. He is our messenger to bring deliverance to our life. Jesus is the one true, the one true deliverer for all people. So if you're here this morning, you've never received him, I invite you to receive him right now and pray with me. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the way that I can come to the Father and to come to God. 
I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I, I receive what you did on the cross, that you died in my place, that you are my Savior. I receive that and I believe that and I put my trust to believe that God raised you from the dead three days later. And I ask you to be my Lord, not just the Lord, to be my Lord. Come into my life, lead my life, guide my life, be number one. And fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may live for you, that I may walk with you all of my days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of Christ. Welcome to, to the beautiful eternal future and looking at, at knowing him now, knowing his presence now, being covered in, in forgiveness and mercy and grace. And for those of us who are believers, Let's thank God that he gives us a job to do. Let's thank God that he gives us direction and that he gives us that oil of gladness, that oil to sustain us, and that he saved us from so much trouble, so much sin, so much destruction. Father, we thank you this morning as believers. We thank you and we say, thank you for giving us a place. Thank you for giving us access and an entrance through Jesus Christ that we can come quickly to you, Father, and pray and say, God, help me. Father, help me. Show me what to do. Show me how to do it. Lord, help us to realize that we are not to, to consider the things, uh, just you, to, to just dismiss you or to ignore you, but that we are to acknowledge you in all things. Lord, help us to walk in a way that's joyful, with the oil of gladness, to be like Eliezer, to take that oil of gladness and, and to help minister to the needs of others, Lord. There are so many people who need your touch, Lord. So I ask that you would use us and fill us with the oil of your gladness, fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh, that we, being filled up, may pour out into others and see your mighty hand in this day. We would see people come to faith and be saved, that we would see people who are falling away from you to come back to you in a, a vibrant and joyful and, and, and wonderful, growing relationship with you. Refresh us, we pray, this morning. Send us out to do your work this week. In Jesus' name, amen.